I wanna start off thanking some folks. So first of all, I wanna thank our panelists who are here to share their thoughts on farming techniques and suggested policy options. We have farmers, policymakers, researchers, educators, advocacy groups, elected officials, and agronomists. So you will see those folks at the top of your screen. Um, and welcome and thank you to the panelists. I also want to thank our host organization, Citizens Climate Education. And John is going to pop the link in the chat. So if you're interested in checking out Citizens Climate Education, uh, that I'm a uh, a staff person there and a member, and you're welcome to check out, not right now, but later after the work, after our panel discussion is done. I also want to thank our event coordinators, and I'm asking them to raise their hand so you can see them. They're going to pop up to the top of the screen, so electronically wave your hand or wave, wave your hand. These are volunteers from Citizens Climate Education chapters, the Richmond chapter, Charlottesville, and Blacksburg chapter. So thank you so much for coordinating this event. I know it was a lot of work and, and here we are ready for tonight. So our format looks like this. We're gonna start off with Chris Lawrence who is state cropland agronomist with USDA and NRCS. And he is going to set the stage for us looking at what in the world is regenerative agriculture and what does that mean for us and how might we look at the nuances there. And then after Chris, we are gonna provide up to four minutes per panelist and they will introduce themselves and share their take on regenerative agriculture. After that round of introductions, we're going to open it up for Q&A for questions and answers from all of you. And we will run that through uh, until eight, 25, right, eight, folks? Is that right? No, eight o'clock. I'm sorry, I'm, I get tacked on an half, extra half hour there. <laughs> um, and then we will wrap it up and we will be interested in hearing what you thought about the panel and what you think we might do in the future. So we don't consider this a one-time event. We hope to do more of these. So I would like the attendees, all of you who are joining us tonight, to, uh, if you have questions that come up for you, for the panelists, to put those in the chat. I wanna tell you there are two people in the chat you can, uh, we would direct your questions to. One is ask me questions for the panelists. That's Chris Wiegart from the Virginia chapter for Citizens Climate Education. And he'll jot those questions down and when we get to Q&A, we'll ask some of the panelists. If you have a tech problem, uh, you can ask that of our tech, ask me questions for tech and, um, and we will answer those tech support there. You'll see that. So feel free to turn to either of those in the chat with any of your questions. Then um, we ask you to stay muted and feel free to turn your video on or off, whatever suits you. We hope to have a lively conversation tonight and to help our panelists know a little bit about who they are speaking to. If you like, please modify your name. This is an advanced Zoom skill. If you can, and let us know, are you a farmer? You could add that to the front of your name, an educator, maybe an ag advisor, a foodie, someone who loves farmers, an elected official. Please go ahead and change your name. It'll be fun to see who is what on this call. You can add that to your name in the renaming. I wanna give a special shout out to State Senator Gisela Hashmi, who is with us tonight, and then the Chesterfield Commissioner of the Revenue, Jennifer Hughes. Also, we have several reps from local soil and water boards throughout the state with us tonight. If you wanna raise your hand, if that's who you are, we'll see also if you've changed your name. So thank you so much to all of those folks for coming and to all of you. Now, in the invitation flyer we sent out, we invited you to watch Living Soil and Kiss the Ground and uh, many of you may have done that. Um, with titles like that, you can tell what we think about the soil, that it's important and alive. I would even say personally, I consider it uh, sacred. And that's how we view it with Citizens Climate Lobby. It's something that is very important to us, how the soil functions. And we know that it is going to play a key role in helping us deal with the climate crisis and the way we work with the soil will play a big role in that. Um, personally, I just wanna share a tiny bit about myself. Uh, I grew up 
a granddaughter of a farming family, so not on the farm, but seeing farms and having a sense that there was something special there, something artistic, visually it appealed to me, something uh, spiritually, the way people worked with the land and connected with the life on the land, something that fed my, my uh, engineer kind of mind scientifically, the way the plants worked and the animals functioned. There was something about agriculture all wrapped up together. And I also knew from an early age that there was something wrong with the way we were functioning in the world. Pollution, hearing about pollution in school and feeling overwhelmed by that problem. I've had the wonderful opportunity to do just about five years of regenerative farming on a piece of land that my aunt gave me in an effort to rebuild a family farm. I am not doing that now because I'm focused fully on my work with citizens climate education, but I do have a young man, Andy Rodriguez, who I invited to join me on the farm and he runs his own regenerative farming enterprises and the only rent I charge him is improving the pasture and building topsoil. So he is doing that work with his American Milking Devons rotating through the pasture on a reinvented family farm. Alrighty, so thank you for letting me introduce myself. It's very personal reasons that I'm here tonight as well as uh, professional. So I wanna turn it over first to Chris Lawrence to uh, talk to us about regenerative agriculture and set the stage. So Chris, if you would unmute yourself, state cropland agronomist. Can you hear me? Yes. Go right ahead. So I will just warn you, there's always a chance that my connection will drop. And so, so let me know if you can't hear me. But um, thank you for having me here. Um, why am I going to take a few extra minutes? And I, it's not that I know more than the other presenters, but, um, but Ann Pierce invited me to do this. She thought I, I had a good perspective to maybe kick this off. And my perspective is a perspective from USDA. I have been paid for the past 17 years to think about and promote soil health and improvement in Virginia. That, that's my job. So um, I am going to give you my perspective, but it is USDA and RCS's perspective. And then in the Q&A, I think you'll probably find that some of my friends uh, among the other uh, panelists will, will help fill in some of the gaps. So look, what is regenerative ag? How are we going to tackle this insanely broad question that you presented to us, right? I've got two suggestions to start. First, let's narrow it down to what is regenerative soil management. I think most of us would, would agree that that's the foundation of any kind of regenerative ag. And it's also the subject, right, of the two movies that we were asked to watch. So that's one. Two, I suggest we turn the question around and we focus on the problem we're trying to solve. And so what is the root cause of soil degradation, right? What is our priority for reversing it? What is the cause of, of soil degradation? Now, I would say you cannot answer that question properly without a historical perspective. And a great place to find that is a book that some of you may know, Dirt, Erosion of Civilizations by Dr. David Montgomery. Write that down, Dirt, Erosion of Civilizations. If you can't commit to reading it or getting an audiobook and listening to it, then go to YouTube and watch a lecture. David's out there, you usually find it summarizing you know, his main points. So that is something you gotta do. So this is what um, this is what David's going to tell you. Broadly speaking, um, because that's what we're doing here, speaking broadly, agricultural systems that have overexploited the soil over time are not the exception in human history. They, they're the rule. So let me repeat that: farming systems that mine the soil, which leads to all sorts of problems, including in many cases the collapse ultimately of the society. Right? It depends on the farming system. They are not the exception. They are the rule across human history. From ancient Greece to colonial Virginia to the Dust Bowl era of our grandparents, and yes, uh, most would say, and I think correctly so, three to today, right? So, so what does that tell us? That tells us that, um, again, broadly speaking now, the tools and technologies of modern agriculture, right, they're not the root cause of the soil degradation problem because I would say, and then our system would say, the core problem is older and it runs deeper than that. So modern ag technology, agrochemicals, which I'm sure will be a hot topic for discussion today, are an important contributing factor, right? But what I propose, what I recommend, and what I come to understand is that if we focus on things like agrochemicals up front, it's usually a trend because it distracts us from the root cause of the problem, right? So what is the root cause of the problem? The vast majority of soil degradation, broadly speaking, has always been is still due to some combination of the following, right? 
And one of my mentors, Dr. Vanlo, is here, and, and I'll see whether he nods um, in agreement. But first, some combination of excessive removal of organic matter, excessive tillage, and or overgrazing. It leaves the soil bare and vulnerable to wind and water erosion, all right? And then second, inadequate return of organic matter to the land. So he's nodding kind of. Um, if that language is too technical, here's a simple way to say it. We take more from the soil than we give back. Again, broadly speaking, we do it now. And the human civilization, we have done it since the dawn of agriculture. You know, and it makes sense. Put yourself in the farmer's shoes. A subsistence farmer in sub-Saharan Africa, or you're farming here in Virginia, using the most modern methods, you're growing a luxury food item, right? It is human nature to prioritize feeding your kids, getting ahead to them, right? Not to plan for small, for long term. And I don't want to get too far off track. I'm just an agronomist, but you know, we think we're civilized, but our brains and our society is still wired, right, for the short term. We know um, we can predict what's going to happen. We have the luxury now in this country to, to invest in the long term, but we, we tend not to. So let me get back into my lane. Um, Topsoil is a lot like you and me, right? When it is repeatedly stripped naked and beaten and starved, or some combination, it either disappears, goes away, or it degrades and dies. So it's that simple. Um, the resulting degradation of soil, just like the degradation of our own health, if we don't take care of it, it can be obvious and very dramatic, or often it can be very subtle and gradual over a long time, so it's invisible on, on a short-term basis. But then you turn around and suddenly realize you've lost a lot, right? So let me, again, bring this up and set the stage perhaps because there will be questions about poisoning the soil with chemicals. And is that a root cause of the problem? And, and I, we can talk about it more later, but again, I think you will find it very helpful to think of modern ag technology, like agrochemicals, as a potentially massive amplifier, right? I'm not saying it's not an issue, but an amplifier of the core problem. But the core problem was here before modern agrochemicals, and it commonly still occurs even when we don't use those chemicals. So it can't just be modern, modern technology. So let me finish up here and try to tie this all together and, and get us back to, well, what is the priority? What are we going to do in our soil management system? I'm going to make another very important point. And, and Anne said that it's just referred to as a shock to many of you. So listen carefully to this. Agriculture is fundamentally unnatural. We can try to mimic nature to maximize our outputs and minimize you know, the inputs we need to put in. Um, but even the most sustainable farming systems I propose involve some degree of practices that have a negative impact on the soil. And, and agriculture is a fundamentally extractive activity, even if it doesn't, you know, isn't obviously so. Um, and so I think you're going to find it very useful to avoid a good versus bad, right, mindset about farming styles and systems. And, Going on to that, it's even more important to avoid a good versus bad mindset about practices and methods. You know, I think, I suggest we should think of these farming practices as either giving back, right, or taking from the soil. Some practices that involve taking from the soil, harvesting, right, taking hay on, tillage, other things, they're simply unavoidable if they want to eat. So, so we are going to do some harm to the soil. So what's our how we fix that? Priority is not to get sidetracked in demonizing a particular ag practice, right, or promoting another. It's about understanding how does the soil work and what is the impact of your particular farming system on it, right? And then the key, we got to make sure we give back more than we take. So some of you may have heard of Sir Albert Howard. You can nod if you have. I'm going to end. Albert, Sir Albert Howard, the law of return, right? At least a broad interpretation of it. We need to obey the law of return and give back. But ultimately, I think what's most useful is a balance sheet concept. And there's a gentleman named Mark Schoenbeck, and there's probably some others who I'm, I'm, I, I nod to and, and say thank you for teaching this idea. Agriculture always involves some degree of taking. We can't avoid that. So the key is to take as little as we can while giving back as much as we can. We, we have to offset what we take. We have to give uh, more than we take and, and make our balance sheet overall positive. So, you know, these are some very broad generalizations, but there's some frameworks I, I think would be useful to you. And so your last question might be, this sounds so simple and obvious. When we take the long-term view, we give more back to the soil than we take. We invest in building the soil health. It's more productive and more resilient for the long term, right? It's just such a win-win. Why don't farmers do it? So again, to you guys, I'm, I'm asking you this. 
let's turn the question around. Why don't all of us, right, live our daily lives, do our jobs, take care of our families, do all that stuff, and integrate at the same time into all those daily tasks and priorities, a super healthy diet and lifestyle, and all the things you know you need to optimize your long-term health and productivity, right? Think about it that way. That is what the farm we're asking the farmer to do. And it all sounds simple, right? Are all 294 of you out there integrating what you know you should do for long-term health and productivity into your lives? Probably not. It sounds simple, but simple doesn't mean easy. And so that is my intro. I hope that's helpful. And I appreciate the opportunity to, to, to set it up for you in that way. Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. I love that focus on uh, focusing on what we're doing right. I think that was also a message I heard there in your introduction. So I want to call on Michael Carter Jr. Where are you on my screen? If you would unmute. And uh, Michael runs Carter Farms. He also is a small business farm resource center coordinator for Virginia State University. And I feel like you are unmuted. I hear you. All right. So um, let me open the door for you. Michael, go ahead and, and share with us your thoughts. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening. Uh, I'm Michael Carter, Jr., and I'm also a victim of very poor rural bar broadband. So if I get cut off, that's the reason. Um, but I'm Michael Carter Jr. with our Carter Farms, a century farm out of Orange County, Virginia. Uh, I also run a nonprofit called Agriculture. It teaches the African and African American contributions to agriculture uh, for young and old alike. Uh, and as well as I work for Virginia State University Small Farm Outreach Program. Uh, and none of my comments here are reflective of Virginia State University. Uh, these are all reflections of me and Carter Farms. Uh, regenerative agriculture has been one of those things that I've grown up with. Um, for some time. I did a lot of organic agriculture, regenerative like agriculture in Africa, and I learned a lot from that experience. Uh, and the biggest thing that I learned was the amount of reinvestment that you need to have at a childhood level. You know, we have nursery schools, we have kindergartens or kindergartens, and then after that, we stop investing in terms of uh, knowledge and vocation about being kinder to our gardens about investing in our nurseries. Um, so I find it you know, most unique as we talk about this, that we don't focus more so on the next generation of farmers to serve as a human shield around the Commonwealth in terms of the environment. Uh, as we look, the vocational educational um, programs in the state are continuing to go down. And it's hard to understand how we'll have any more investment into preserving our environment regeneratively we don't invest in the next generation of farmers. Uh, in addition to investing in the next generation of farmers, there's a demographic of farmers, black farmers and indigenous farmers that are practically extinct. The numbers are depleting so that within another generation, there'll probably be minimal. And when I say minimal, I say less than 500 of these farmers in the state if nothing is done. Um, and these are your farmers along with other farmers, small scale farmers, who want to be your best option to help to regenerate, not just the soil, which is key as a vegan for almost 20 years, I eat strictly because of this. I eat uh, vegetables strictly because of this um, and regenerating the soil. But in regenerating the soil, you also regenerate the soul. When we start to make the soil the soul connection, you start to hit another level of understanding amongst people. Um, and then we start to hit the soil and soul connection. We start you know, hitting the church connection and attaching that to your spirituality. Regenerative agriculture is a movement to save your own life. We've watched how COVID has re, re altered, re shifted our environment, our business environment, our farming environment, um, our schooling environment. And some of that is because our soul is depleted, because our soil is depleted. So, therefore, we don't have the nutritional wherewithal to deal with these changing viruses that, that have come uh, upon us. Um, and I am a, definitely a student of uh, Dr. Lauder Milk and some other folks who wrote about those civilizations and the civilization decline. Um, and we're seeing that if we don't do something now in the Commonwealth and throughout the state or throughout the world or country rather, we're going to find ourselves in a tremendous decline uh, where we're going to not just erode our souls, we're going to erode our soul, souls to the point that we're not going to be able to sustain ourselves for uh, any more uh, generations to come. Um, so at Carter Farms, we try to focus on regenerative practices. Um, 
and it's a battle because I'm uh, a fifth generation farmer. And my uncle, who I'm so, supposed to be taking over from, is not regenerative in any way, shape, or form. So we have a lot of a uh, gentle time. Yeah. I'm gonna you got get wrap go ahead and wrap it up and then we'll because I'm I'm on the time. I'm done. <laughs> no problem. I'm done. Thank you. Oh good, thank you. I was I was enjoying your talk. It was hard to be the timekeeper, but thank you so much. Good. All right. So I want to ask Brent Willis Wills to Brent Wills to open up his um, microphone for us. And Brent is with Bramble Hollow Farm Agroecology Consultant and the president of the Virginia Association of Biological Farmers. So, and then- Thanks, Ellie. Thanks, I'm gonna- Hi, can you hear me? Yourself. Uh -huh. Yeah, go right ahead. All right, thank you very much. Um, well, I appreciate the offer of uh, being asked to, to be here. And uh, basically uh, my perspective is, um, you kind of have to know a little bit of my background and since we don't have three hours for me to talk about my background, like we none of us do, um, basically I, I'm one of those people that has sort of an environmental science background and an agricultural background. And I've been spending the last 25 or 30 years or so trying to figure out how those things mesh. And uh, what I have finally realized after um, starting my own agroecology uh, consulting firm in 2012, almost 10 years ago now, which is hard to believe, uh, but that the two of those are extremely powerful forces when they work together, much more so than when they are working apart, you know, in different directions. And uh, basically what I mean by that is as a farmer, uh, you know, all farmers will, um, say that they are uh, the first environmentalist. They're gonna be taking care of the environment because that's what pays their bills. Uh, and that's true, that is true. And what the regenerative agricultural um, movement is doing is, it, is it's trying to bring those two ideas uh, to the same table. And I wanna add to what Chris Lawrence said just a few minutes ago, he talked about uh, David Montgomery and a book that David had written um, and I don't exactly remember when it was written, but I've read that uh, Dirt, uh, the, uh, one of the earlier books he did. One of the most recent books that he's done, though, is called Growing a Revolution. And it is basically centered completely around, it's sort of taking that next step from uh, his book, um, Dirt, the Erosion of Civilization. And it's going to the next step of, okay, how do we actually build upon that? We realize what some of the mistakes that past civilizations have made. We realize that, that we have made some, uh, maybe some misguided decisions based on land, uh, uh, for our land management, based on uh, things that are sort of outside our food production realm. And what regenerative ag for me really does is it brings it all in house and says, okay, we realize that we have climate issues and social justice issues and rural economy issues and uh, food production issues and uh, human health issues on a broad scale. Soil health and regenerative practices is the one place where all those things come together in a, a nexus of opportunity for us to say, we know what, what direction we've been going in with our, our food production. We know what direction we've go, been going in with our land management. And we know what direction we want to go from here. So um, sort of to, to piggyback on what Chris said, um, you know, this the, in my mind, as an agroecology consultant and a farmer myself, the idea right now is not to say, we've got to eliminate all these tools that are at our disposal, but we need to start thinking about the direction of soil health and utilizing the knowledge we have that says, this is, um, this is really the thing that we need to be doing that's going to build and regenerate and provide that soil health uh, versus these are some of the things that we realize may not be the best. Let's find a way to, to maybe incorporate the better methods and, and practices moving forward and look at things like nutrient density and uh, uh, yields and high production 
and water infiltration and all these other ecosystem benefits that uh, we all can talk about and we all can put our finger on, but we can't necessarily quantify. So um, again, it, it sort of Chris made the comment about mimicking nature and uh, yes, agriculture in general is a very extractive uh, activity, but using regenerative practices and focusing on the health of the soil and having that soil system feed itself as much as we possibly can is a way to overcome that uh, um, totally extractive nature of agriculture and actually be able to, to complement that natural cycle the way that we, with our brains, know that we can do. So um, thank you. that's my time. <laughs> Thanks. Timing. Thank you, Brent. Um, mm -hmm. Glad to have your voice here. Thank All you. right, so I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Greg Evangelo to unmute and then after you, Greg, will have Dustin Madison. So um, Dr. Greg is also a member of the Citizens Climate Education Chapter in Blacksburg. He's a professor uh, at the School of Plant and Environmental Scientists, Sciences at Virginia Tech, so. Great. Thank you so much, Ellie, for the invitation to participate this evening and uh, welcome to everybody out in the uh, hinterlands there. Uh, what I'd like to do is address an aspect of soil health uh, that, on which I've worked for several decades. We know that soil health contributes both to crop productivity and quality, but also to environmental benefits such as clean water and climate change mitigation. We've heard about the benefits of organic matter from uh, crops, but there are external sources of organic matter that can be also be used to improve soil health. The recycling of organic residuals or what some people might call wastes from agriculture, um, municipalities such as yard trimmings, uh, industrial sources such as paper mill and food processing sludges, uh, these processes um, result in a sustainable method of improving soil health by restoring and increasing organic matter and sequestering carbon in soil. However, a significant portion of these so-called wastes, food wastes and others are often disposed of in landfills and incinerated, which increases greenhouse gas emissions via landfill methane production and impairs air quality. Furthermore, the potential benefit of the organic matter in these materials is, are lost. So composting of such byproducts enables the stabilization of this organic matter into humus like we have in the soil. It results in the destruction of pathogens and weed seeds and converts chemical therapeutics that one might have in animal manures, for instance, and other trace organic compounds into lower risk compounds. So the addition of composted and uncomposted organic byproducts can improve soil, physical, chemical, and biological property for enhanced crop production and reduction of soil, air, and water impairment risk. In addition, sequestering the carbon in organic matter in the soil provides a climate change mitigation tool. So compost is invaluable for soil health, but its use is typically limited to urban landscapes such as lawns and gardens and smaller agricultural operations. A great benefit to society can be facilitated by policies that promote increased composting of many wastes that are typically disposed of and then using compost on more and more of our agricultural lands, even our larger lands. By doing so, we can uh, use, use this material wisely and improve our soils for regenerative purposes. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll end it and look forward to later uh, discussion. Thank you, Dr. Avenello. All right, so Dustin Madison with Angle Family Farms and White Farm Systems, um, farm and conservation plant manager. So Dustin, share your thoughts with us, please. Great, thanks a lot. Um, really appreciate being here. Uh, a little background. I've probably worked on about 50,000 acres of, of row crops over, across the state here in maybe the last 20 years. Um, to give you a little scale of, 
of the work that I've done. Um, not a lot of small stuff. It's all really big stuff. So it might approach this from a little bit different perspective. Um, I've seen every type of management that you can think of. If you watch Kiss the Ground, I've seen, uh, I've seen the, the first one that they showed in 1930 of how people work the ground. And I've seen the most progressive of those. Uh, I can also tell you that in the last 10 years, I've seen a massive shift towards better practices. We are absolutely doing better in Virginia than, than we were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or 50 years ago. Um, so that's encouraging. Uh, I think also you, you take that and you say, what else can we do? Um, and again, I'll go back to the movies because who doesn't want to listen to Woody Harrelson tell you what to do? Um, we could be a big part of this solution as farmers. We're, we already have the tools to do a lot. Um, we know what to do. It, it's just the fact of getting it done. Um, so, so how do we go that far? Um, I think it takes engagement. It takes engagement from consumers, takes engagement from uh, individuals, corporate entities, and the government. What steps do we take to, to kind of pull all this stuff together and say, how can I get 1.5% of the population who are the people farming to kind of carry some of this load for 100% of the population, the people who are consuming not just the food, but the energy and, and all kind of the, the parts of life that we really like. Uh, so, so what do we do to get to that point? Um, one thing that's really caught my attention is, is a carbon market. And the reason it's caught my attention is because I, I can tell you from the farm side, some of these practices are, are not cheap. We know they work. We know they will increase our ability to do a good job farming over time. But a 5% return over a long period of time it is tough to stomach when you're working on a budget. So I look at things like carbon markets that maybe tie some of these things together. Can, can we get Microsoft to say, hey, we're going to offset some of this carbon emission problem that we have by, by paying that money forward to farmers. Do the things that science has proven you need to do to do a good job. Um, and to kind of take some of the load off of, off of our back or off of uh, airlines back or energy sectors back. Um, we can be a curative part of this solution, which it's not just solar panels and electric cars, um, you know, cutting down on emissions, but we can actually take part of the problem that's already there and, and remove it. We can fix part of this problem. Um, those are some of the things that I kind of look at because we have to always remember that it's going to take money to fix stuff. It always takes money to fix stuff. But I don't want to just say we, we go to the government and, and mandate a tax or we go to the government and look for a, a handout for a farm. Um, I really want to use a market approach. It seems to work in most places, but we, we also kind of need help from the government to make sure that market is, is legitimate and fair. Um, everybody has to win on a market-based approach. We, we can't go out there and uh, cut our own throats on trying to fix a carbon problem. Um, I'm happy to talk about that stuff. Any, anytime we can, uh, I will leave you on the end of the Living Soil movie where the former governor of Maryland said it's going to take a lot of money and a lot of courage to make this work. And he was totally right. Um, but we have to have that, that investment from everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin. And that's a, a nice transition to call on Delegate Rodney Willett, if we would. And then after you, we'll have Dr. John Fike. So... Delegate Willett, there you go. Go ahead. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. So it's it's great to uh, great to be here. And I, I took the uh, instruction to heart in terms of updating our title. So I am a delegate, but on this call, looking at some of the folks here, I I've, I feel like I'm the lowest ranking member. So I put on uh, assistant to the gardener. That's my role at home. Uh, my wife's the gardener, and I I do what she tells me to do. So I'm I'm trying to trying to learn. But I know it, it's great to be with you. Uh, this evening and um, really appreciate the opportunity. Actually, it's a great cross-section of folks who, who've joined, so it, it's it's very impressive. Um, I'm going to give you just a little bit of a snapshot of, of the current legislative sessions and things that uh, could, I think, have a very positive impact on what we're talking about uh, tonight. I think uh, everyone in this call is going to know how important agriculture is to Virginia. It's actually our largest private industry by a huge margin. 
Um, I serve on uh, Virginia's the House of Delegates, Agriculture, Chesapeake Bay and Natural Resources Committee. So I do spend a lot of time looking at these issues. Uh, it's interesting, my, my first exposure really to regenerative farming, at least in terms of what I knew the term was actually from a constituent who had told me about the, uh, the Kiss the Ground uh, documentary, which, which is excellent. And that's a great, a great resource for, uh, for all of us. Um, but, uh, but let me go through a couple bills here and I'll tell you that it's, uh, we're, we're at the point in our legislative session where we, what we call crossover. So it's a pretty busy day, although um, someone said today was a light day because they don't, you know, two of the things we dealt with, one was repealing the death penalty and the other was legalizing marijuana. So I, I'm not sure I call that a light day, but it is um, the, the, kind, the kind of things we're, we're dealing with. And I guess you could put the marijuana part into the the agriculture realm, because that is is, is a crop that uh, Virginia will be uh, uh, growing legally uh, in the not too distant uh, future. So more to more to come on that. Um, and one point of reference for all of this, um, Virginia has a great legislative information system. So anything I'm talking about tonight, if you just type, literally just type in the letters LIS or LIS.gov, you will get access to everything that's going on at the legislature in terms of tracking these bills. You can actually watch, if you're truly bored, you can actually watch us um, with the, uh, the, the, the live stream that's provided for all of our floor sessions. Actually, we do all the subcommittee and committee, uh, commit, committee meetings as well. Um, all that's on uh, online now. And, and in fact, uh, because we're, we the House are in a virtual session this year, we've actually um, had our public, we've been participating uh, via Zoom and we've had the public uh, participating uh, via Zoom. And I think in some cases that's actually worked out pretty well because just like tonight, we've got folks coming from all parts of the state to, uh, to testify. And in some cases that, that normally would be like a six, you know, five and a half hour drive for some people coming from Southwest. So I think the virtual world actually has a few advantages, although I do miss the uh, the interpersonal uh, contact there. So I'll actually start with a Senate bill, SB 1290 from my friend Monty Mason. It's called the Conserve Virginia Program. And this is, it's already passed the Senate. We're gonna see it in the house shortly, but basically um, uses a data-driven GIS-based model to prioritize potential conservation areas across the Commonwealth. And that's a big, a big deal. And this is a coordinated effort with the Virginia Farm Bureau and the Virginia Agribusiness Council. So hopefully that'll make make more effective use of those conservation uh, areas. Um, another one, one to flag, it also has really significant support is HB 2068 from uh, Sam Rasool. And this is a local food and farming infrastructure grant program. And it creates a program by that name. And this is basically to facilitate or support community infrastructure development projects that support local food production and sustainable agriculture. It's basically a matching program. So. If, if someone is approved and applies, they'll, they'll get a $25,000 grant and that's supposed to be matched uh, by the locality. So we're trying to get some of those programs going. Um, I'm actually working with uh, Speaker Philicorn on HB 2203. I'm the chief uh, co-patron for a bill that's creating a Virginia Agricultural Food Assistance Program. Uh, this is just passed the house and it basically, um, provides funding to charitable food organizations like food banks to reimburse, reimburse the, the cost of food that's donated from uh, Virginia farmers and food produce, producers. So it has a sort of a connection to agriculture there. And then finally, I just wanted to mention that there are a number of bills on the environmental front. And I think it all comes back to taking care of, of what we have here, particularly a state like Virginia, which we're, we're so blessed with so many amazing uh, resources. So you probably remember Last year, we passed the, the Clean Economy Act, which moves us towards a carbon neutral, being a carbon neutral state by no later than 2040. Uh, to get there, there are other things we need to do. And, and the, the most important thing we need to do is to get our vehicle emissions down. So you should have seen the, the House passed a uh, the bill to do just that, adopt a new emission standard and also require uh, greater use of electric vehicles. Um, there's another bill I've had. I'm gonna jump in. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. I, I love hearing about these bills. And uh, I also do want to get on to the other presenters. Yeah, absolutely. Emily has put a bunch of the links that you mentioned to those bills in the chat. So if anybody wants to check in the chat uh, for those bills, and certainly um, it's fun to see the progress in the General Assembly. So thank you, Jeff. Yeah, absolutely. I like that. It's good to join you. 
All right, and so next is Dr. Fike, and then after Dr. Fike, we'll have Janet and Dan, and then we'll wrap it up with the Congresswoman uh, Spanberger. So, John, I think you wanted to share your uh, slides or something. Yeah, so so I'm the uh, the old professor type here, and I'm going to bore you with a few slides, and I apologize for that, but maybe it's uh, a testament to my poor speaking, extemporaneous speaking ability. Um, I was asked. Oops, wait a minute here. You hit the share screen first. All right, I'm hoping you can see this slide that says regenerative agriculture. Yep, let's go. All right, very good. So I'm gonna pull that up into, uh, now you're in speaker view. Shoot, I had this switched earlier. Uh, you'll just have to watch it with me. Um, I was asked to speak about regenerative agriculture and what roles that pasture and livestock might play in that and whether uh, trees and solar panels might also be integrated into these systems. And so I wanted to start with this picture uh, to make a point about cattle uh, and about people. Um, if I were to ask you what's missing from this image, you might say soil or maybe ground cover or maybe regulatory oversight. Uh, but I think the thing that I would reply is what's missing is good management. You know, grazing systems, whether you like them or not, I'll just say grazing systems can and do offer a lot of opportunities to improve lands and landscapes. Uh, and unfortunately, we've got too many parts of Virginia that have suffered from overgrazing or overstocking or both. And that results in lost soil, lost nutrients, lost soil carbon, the, the issue at hand here, lost water that doesn't infiltrate. Uh, and then that water runs off with nutrients and soil and sediments that results in poor water quality and lost profit and lost long-term productivity of that landscape. So I just wanted to take a, a moment to make a kind of a shameless plug, actually um, not shameless, but a very, very um, proud plug for a program called Graze 300 Virginia. Um, and I don't have time to go into detail about this program, but it's called Graze 300 Virginia because if you can manage pastures on your farm to allow about 300 days of grazing, you're getting pretty close to the economic sweet spot uh, on your operation. And if you have questions, I would encourage you, you know, if, particularly for you producers in the audience, if you have questions, uh, please reach out to your local extension agent. Um, a number of our agents are working with this program and they're helping farmers think about how to right size herds to the operational land base that they have. Many people, I think, struggle because they probably are overstocked. And actually, sometimes destocking or reducing the stocking rate can remove can improve your profitability. It's not just what comes in to the system, it's also what goes out, right? So we've got a number of people that can help you improve grazing management and can help you think about appropriate herd size so that, that you uh, can do a better job of managing and be more profitable. Now, a lot of this talk, when you start talking to people about how to manage and how to do a better job, it's going to get back to providing adequate rest and recovery. And in a carbon sequestration story, you know, that's really essential for building roots and for building soil carbon. And I'm showing you both uh, these images, one with a native grass and one with tall fescue, which is our most common pasture forage. In both of these cases, where we've got a high intensity or a high frequency of defoliation, what, what happens is we lose root systems, we have loss of productivity, and coupled with that will be loss of soil and soil health. Dr. So I'm gonna jump in. Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is a class I would love to attend. Uh, I think- we Am might... I already at four minutes? <laughs> yeah, you're up at four minutes. Okay, so uh, I will stop right there. Awesome, thank you. And uh, such wonderful material all through our presentation tonight so far. So thank you so much for sharing that. I, I personally am a um, grazier and I love hearing about that. So I could have you go on and on, but we will move along and hear from Janet and Dan, who are co-owners and co-operators of Broad Fork Farm. There you go, good to see you. Hi Ellie, thanks. Um, all right, we're gonna try to um, tag team this 
quickly and efficiently. Uh, so to paint the picture really quickly, um, our farm we're in Chesterfield, just south of Richmond, very much in a suburban area, not mm. agricultural. We are on five acres and intensively cultivate just two acres, growing mostly vegetables, certified naturally grown, follows the same um, rules as certified organic. Uh, we uh, a small number of flowers and herbs, primarily vegetables. We do grow year round, though in the um, winter time, all the harvest is coming out of um, hoop houses or greenhouses. In general, we are selling what we grow directly to about 250 households, um, to talk in simplest terms. Um, really quickly, the name of our farm and the movie our kids were watching just ended, so watch out. Um, the name of our farm is um, the Broad Fork, which is a tool to use um, instead of tilling. Um, so imagine a giant, um, large tonged, uh, tined um, pitchfork upside down. But anyway, it allows us to work the soil, aerate the soil slightly, um, and allow amendments to work in without tilling the soil. Um, we can do this when we're just cultivating two acres. Um, and the people that we're feeding in general live very close to the farm. We don't um, transport anything farther than 20, 25 miles. Um, Dan's gonna run through a list of things we do. Yeah, so we're, we're a small farm, um, two acres. Um, we're two acres because that's all we could afford. The land that we're, we are growing on uh, was grown, uh, probably 150 years of, of growing and we are forced to use regenerative practices. Some of the things that we do, and we do these regenerative practices because we need to be more resilient, not only in our growing, but in, in, our, in, in the way that interrelates with our business as well. Um, so I just want to go over some of those practices that maybe you heard about in the movies and some perhaps that you didn't. Um, we do very little to no tillage on a lot of our crops and on a lot of our soil. We keep it covered it, um, as, as much as we can, either with uh, plastic tarps or um, mulches or cover crops, in addition to living plants, those that we're growing, uh, cover crops. One thing that we do do that wasn't, um, I don't believe in either of the movies, is the use of basalt dust um, in order to, uh, which is referred to an enhanced uh, rock weathering. Uh, silicate rocks, uh, byproduct dust from mining industries can be used, especially basalts and, and silicas, to actually sequester carbon, um, forming uh, carbonates. And I know there's probably some PhDs there who can probably speak to that a little bit more about how that process works, but it's exciting and, um, and it's been a great incorporation on our farm and very inexpensive. Um, we're using compost, mulches, high diversity of crops. Um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, we're going to talk super quickly. We think we have one minute remaining about consumers and legislators. And um, so, so we want to really echo what Chris Lawrence said about um, the simple and not easy solution, which is what we do as organic farmers every day. And we choose the more expensive, more difficult, and um, more correct action. Um, I know I'm, I'm getting in a dicey uh, world there using... Um, but, right, it's, um, <laughs> we know that buying food grown this way is more expensive. We know it because we also buy it um, from other people and we're paying those costs as farmers um, uh, going in. But we, we challenge consumers to reprioritize their spending as much as they are able. Um, we challenge, um, or we work with, and we love working with our representative, Abigail Spanberger, up next, um, about legislation that really encourages and rewards, especially when tied to the market, as was said earlier, um, this type of farming, um, very, very specifically compost, curbside, and biochar, and we'll talk more about that in the Q&A, perhaps. Awesome. Thank you both, Janet and Dan. Uh, all right, so last but not least, bringing us back to the question of policy is Congresswoman Abigail Spanberger, who is with the U.S. House of Representatives of Virginia 7th District and uh, a co-sponsor of the Growing Climate Solutions Act, among other good work. So where are you, Abigail? Unmute yourself and jump in. All right. Well, it's so good to see you. And Ellie, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Citizens Climate Lobby for inviting me to be with you all today. And I have quite a few constituents on the line. So um, I'm just so grateful to participate in this discussion. Uh, I love the topic of the intersection of agriculture and addressing the climate crisis. Um, I think it is a fascinating um, area for me to concentrate on here in Congress, and I have the privilege of serving on the House 
Agriculture Committee, also the House Foreign Affairs Committee, but on the Agriculture Committee, I also am the subcommittee chair for the Conservation and Forestry Subcommittee. So in that subcommittee, we get to speak to um, incredible producers from across the country and scientists who are focused on um, smart practices that are important and valuable um, and uh, profitable for producers. Uh, and we've had the privilege of having uh, Dustin Madison come before our subcommittee. Um, and, and talk about these issues that are so incredibly important. And I loved the film Kiss the Ground. Uh, it is uh, certainly uh, one of my very favorite documentaries and I have been a little bit evangelizing because I love the space, as I said, of where agriculture and uh, climate change really come together. And I had a, uh, a producer once tell me, well, well, two things. Uh, farmers and producers are the, the first, you know, to be successful, you have to be focused on conserving what it is that, that you're working with. Uh, and then uh, farmers and producers are the first uh, work from home folks. So for everyone who has mentioned their broadband internet connectivity issues, I hear you noted. It is a major focus of mine in Congress. Um, but, you know, this is, this is why I'm so proud to have introduced Growing Climate Solutions Act. Uh, we introduced it in the last Congress. We'll be introducing it again. It's bipartisan, bicameral. We brought together a large group of members of Congress and members of the Senate who want to help bring farmers and producers to the table to help address the climate crisis using natural solutions. Um, and the beauty of this policy really is that we're not asking producers to do anything new or anything that wouldn't actually benefit them economically. And so for generations across Central Virginia, as, as we've heard from some of the producers on the line, uh, growers have engaged in voluntary conservation practices that have improved crop quality, increased crop yield, protected the health of our soil and water, and sequestered carbon. Um, and so many of them, uh, so many of these farmers and producers and agribusinesses have important perspectives and experiences to bring to the table when we're up here uh, or Rodney and his colleagues in Richmond are talking about how do we tackle the challenges posed by the climate, climate crisis. Um, and one of the biggest challenges is really getting those voices to the table and increasing communication among farmers and producers about these beneficial practices. Uh, and so that's why I'm excited about this bill. It would bring the expertise of USDA to the table to help ensure that farmers who may not have previously engaged in these conservation practices understand the benefits, can nav navigate voluntary carbon markets, and in doing so uh, can be a part of the solution all while uh, ac accessing a new source of revenue, which you know is part of the larger discussion. Regenerative agriculture isn't free. Uh, conservation process uh, processes and procedures and, and uh, um, efforts that producers undertake, they have long-term e economic benefits through increased crop yield and improved crop quality, but it, it is expensive to implement and it does require a real commitment from farmers and producers who want to learn new practices. Um, and this has already been recognized in the structure of multiple federal programs like EQIP, um, but more should be done and this is a focus of mine, to bring value to farmers for a whole host of eco-services that they provide. Um, and while doing so, ensure that the conservation programs are more responsive to the economic realities faced by farmers and producers on the ground. Um, that's why Growing Climate Solutions Act would ask USDA to help facilitate carbon markets, um, in, in essence, by verifying the verifiers and make sure that those who claim to have the ability to monitor and monetize carbon sequestration of conservation practices are doing so in a very clear and transparent way. Um, it's also why I am excited about having introduced and led a bill called Healthy Soil Resilient Farmers Act of 2020. We'll be reintroducing that again in the new Congress, um, though I sometimes mistakenly, it is my own bill, but I sometimes mistakenly call it Healthy Soil Happy Farmers. But I actually uh, think that I might go with that as the nickname because when we are strengthening um, existing working land conservation programs by creating additional flexibility um, related to soil health transition loans um, at the Farm Services Administration, um, we would be, this bill would create enhanced loans that would allow farmers who want to adopt best practices in cover cropping, 
uh, resource conserving crop rotation, advanced grazing management, organic production, or other techniques, uh, it would help ensure that the, the loans and the point of entry from a financial perspective um, is one that uh, you know, is not so prohibitive, that they have the flexibility in those loans uh, and in uh, federal support to be able to uh, adopt these practices. Uh, so this is just, a, a, you know, in, in my view, some of the first steps. Uh, it is increasingly an area of excitement here on Capitol Hill uh, for, for so many people who are focused on climate change but want to have that conversation of what can we tactically do. Um, the, the, again, the cross-section of agriculture uh, because so much is already happening that's inspiring and exciting, but uh, we need to continue making sure that more people know about the benefits um, is, is really um, just an exciting thing to focus on here on Capitol Hill. I'm so pleased to join you all today, um, and I'm so grateful to have uh, had the chance to visit some of your farms. Uh, Mr. Carter, please be forewarned. Uh, I would love to come visit uh, your farm as well uh, and to any of the other producers on the line. Um, I'm, I'm just grateful for all that you do, and thank you for welcoming me here today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Representative Spanberger. All right, so now we're going to move into Q&A, and I'm going to ask my partner in the Q&A part, Chris Wegard, if you would open, unmute yourself, if you have a question you'd like to get us started. Well, uh, this is a question that... Um, it's, it's interesting that several people ask this question because we have a lot of non-farmers on the line. And the, the question came up, what can homeowners with a yard do to participate in this process? And um, then a sort of a follow-up question was, can, what can citizens do to get their local governments to help with this process by composting food and tree waste and making it available to homeowners. All right, does anyone wanna, any one of our panelists wanna unmute and jump in on that? Well, I can take a shot. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Look, um, USDA has these principles for soil, building soil health, and they start four basic principles. The first is keep the soil covered. Um, I think in the movie, one of the movies, you heard Keith Burns, farmer from Nebraska, say, if you want to take care of your soil, you should never see it. It needs to be covered. So that's the first rule. Um, and then the second is minimize disturbance. And of course, for homeowners, maybe they're, they're not going to do no-till, but um, compaction is a concern. I mean, don't park your cars on, on, uh, on your lawn. Um, those kind of simple things. The soil is a sponge, and, and it should be treated as a living sponge. And then grow plants. Um, Keep something growing, vigorous roots. Um, that photosynth photosynthesis, that's how we take carbon out of the air and we put it into the soil. So um, yes, composting, and um, uh, but, but those are some thoughts from me. Awesome, thank you, Chris. And yeah, that a big answer to how do you get policy is get involved uh, in the politics in order to have policy happen. All right, Chris, give us another question. Well, there, this is sort of a related question, but we, we had a couple people talking about um, carbon markets and asking for their pros and cons. But then we, we also had the question, farmers worry that talk of climate change will mean poorly designed regulations. And how can we build trust with farmers who may be expected to make difficult changes, but still have got to make profit? Okay, wonderful. I wonder if, um, Dustin, you mentioned in your uh, talk, starting us off, talk about carbon markets, if you might comment a bit on that. Yeah, so um, you know, the, the idea behind these carbon markets is, is, is kind of simple, um, but it doesn't have any rules to it. So that's what makes it a little tough. Um, right now, you know, a, a company could go out to a farmer and say, I want you to employ these regenerative practices. Um, we'll document them and then we'll get them verified by a third party to prove that it actually happened. And then we'll figure out how many tons of carbon you've actually sequestered. Then we'll put them on a marketplace and try to get that sold, whether it's through a corporation or just people who want to offset their footprint. Um, that's great. Uh, the problem is we've got lots of these markets that are developing now 
think there's there's only like three that are really going strong today, but there's dozens that have popped up. You can Google it, and they're everywhere right now. They just haven't really gotten going, um, which means there's dozens of different ways that they're being done. We don't have any real structure. And my concern, and I think the concern of a lot of farmers, is that there's no structure. It's either going to build momentum and then fade away, or um, it's going to lose a lot of value. And, and there's going to be a price because people will, will want to feel good about offsetting their footprint, um, but it won't realistically pay for the steps that a farmer has to take to do that work. So I would say that's the biggest con is that we don't have any rules. We don't have any structure. Um, the pro is that we can, we can put this money into the farm economy and accomplish the goals that we want to accomplish. Um, what we really need is somebody like USDA um, to step in and not necessarily own this whole marketplace, but provide a little bit of a framework. That's what we really depend on. Something that uh, something that a consumer will know what they're buying and a farmer will know what they're selling. So we can have a lot of confidence to make it work. And somebody on this panel actually has a great bill that she's put forth that makes a lot of sense. That's perfect segue. Let's hear from the Congresswoman, if you would speak a little bit about the Growing Climate Solutions Act. Well, and um, the part of the question was, uh, you know, how do we get farmers involved? And, and uh, my, my initial response to your question was, we listen to farmers. Uh, we listen to farmers, we bring them to the table, and, you know, sometimes those of us in elected office like to, like to talk a bit. Um, I have the benefit of having absolutely no background in agriculture, not even a little bit. I, I have, I struggle to keep basil alive, which is um, a good perspective because I know what I don't know, which is everything. Um, and so I have had the opportunity to learn from farmers and producers like Destin. Um, and, and to his point, recognizing that it, it sounds great to say, well, we've got carbon markets. It's a place for producers to you know, be able to monetize their good practices, but if there's no structure to it, there's no accountability to it, there's no standards to it, are we potentially setting a situation up where uh, producers engage in practices and you know, that private entity goes by the wayside? So that's why this bill, informed by real farmers and producers and their needs, uh, said we have to have USDA involved. And so USDA is going to certify the markets according to our bill uh, to ensure that, it, that, uh, that we have like third party verifiers that, 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 uh, that provide that level of comfort uh, and stability to the producers who want to join. And then I would say overall, when it comes to regulations, when it comes to uh, how we approach this discussion, you know, for starters, we got to be honest about the fact that sometimes the conversation lives in a strange place. When we're talking about CO2 emissions, we can't be talking about, uh, you know, methane emissions from cattle. We need, uh, and I've had some funny conversations with a producer, and I don't think it was you, Dustin, but somebody who said, well, you know, that's not actually like cow flatulence, it's actually cow burps. Right, And so if we're talking about an, an issue here, we all need to at least know what we're talking about. But those very same cows, when you know, employing restorative practices are absolutely part of the solution. Um, and so sometimes I think it becomes difficult for farmers and producers to trust that you know, everybody on Capitol Hill might know what we're talking about when the, there are these kind of pieces that live all over the space. But I would say, Boiling it down, it has to be all carrots and no sticks, right? Those are the sorts of efforts to bring farmers and producers to the table because frankly, employing these practices help them. And if we just make it a bit easier or a bit more straightforward and provide a bit more certainty, who, who wouldn't want to do these things? Uh, that's my, my sunny view of it, but I'm just, uh, I'm just so excited about the possibilities that exist here. Wonderful, thank you. All right, just a quick reminder, when you have questions that you wanna ask the panelists, please go to the chat and send them to the Ask Me Questions person who is Chris Wiegart and we'll circle over to Chris and ask for another question that we can bring to the panel. Okay, well, we, we did have one question for that had to do with beginning farmers. And that was, Okay, imagine that I am a beginning farmer and I'm interested in regenerative farmer, farming. 
and perhaps I didn't find out about it in school. Um, where do I find good advice? Where do I find great information about what to plant, how to plant it, how to space it, how to rotate it to achieve those regenerative results that, that we're talking about? Wonderful, great. Let's, uh, Michael, are you there? Michael Carter, maybe you could respond to that for us and then maybe also Dr. Fike could. Where is Michael? I wonder if we lost him from the internet. Internet. All right, so John, would you jump in? Well, so, you know, I'm, I'm a product of land grant university system and uh, I'm gonna be a proponent of the land grant university system because, uh, you know, at least I would hope that the land grant is providing credible information. Um, but for many of you, you don't necessarily have to get straight to the land grant. You have the opportunity to visit with an extension agent in your county uh, who can help you with these questions. And if they don't have the ability to answer some of your questions, you can take that to the extension specialists uh, that are located at uh, Petersburg at Virginia State or in Blacksburg at Virginia Tech. Um, there's also a beginning farmer and rancher program and the beginning agroforester program uh, that are run through Virginia Tech as well. So there, there are a number of those resources right off the bat that you can go to. And I'm gonna pass the ball to Dr. Avanilo because he may have even better thoughts on some of this. Awesome, thank you. Well, thanks, John. <laughs> um, in addition to what uh, John mentioned, I would uh, have people look into a faculty member here at Virginia Tech whose name is Kim Nawalny. She's in um, a department that has changed its name. Uh, she's in community education and development. And she runs, she's responsible for a statewide program for beginning farmers and ranchers. And she's constantly has information out for uh, before COVID uh, in-person workshops throughout the state. Uh, during the rest of the remainder of this, um, this session, I will uh, find a link to her program and I'll put it in the chat room. Wonderful, thank you. And I wonder if we might hear from Janet and Dan on that. Uh, what was the route you took to get into your farming? <clears throat> we were just sort of joking, you could zoom in on our bookshelf right there, you get a great view. Um, you know, and, and when we were trying to get going 12, 13 years ago, there was um, a pretty, pretty big dearth of um, literature on um, what we do, the small scale, diversified, highly diversified model. Um, and there's just tremendous um, more and wonderful books, um, it, numerous by um, fantastic Virginia authors as well. Um, uh, so I don't know, do we start listing them or do we just, I mean, it's easier maybe to just um, uh, provide a link or um, a list written. Um, sure, that would later. be nice, yeah. Good, good. Yeah, I'll, so say, I'll say Pam Dolling and Ira Wallace. Um, <laughs> Ira Wallace um, as two local Virginia women. Hey, Ellie, can I jump in on that? Sure, go right ahead. Hey, uh, the Virginia Association for Biological Farming is a uh, great resource for that kind of thing. Um, you know, uh, Dan and Janet are members, farms, as well as several other folks that are um, involved in this today. And that's one of the local organizations that you can actually go, um, you know, if we can get back to a situation where we're in person, but you can actually talk to farmers that are doing this kind of thing, uh, just like Janet and Dan are doing and, and, and other farms across Virginia that are doing this on not just a small scale, but they're doing it on a, on a midsize and a larger scale as well. So, uh, you know, from a perspective of soil health practices and regenerative practices, one of the big things that I do want to quickly say, adding on to this conversation is, it's not just for small farmers and gardeners. You know, this is a, uh, this is a type of uh, philosophy and land management regime that can be taken on broad acre applications uh, like Dustin's operating in uh, across several counties, you know, in the Commonwealth, but also in smaller farms and everybody in between. 
Um, we talked about a lot of these resources and books. There are a lot of books out there now by folks that have, have a lot of evidence and a lot of um, data built upon them extrapolating these smaller, more organic, if you'd like, soil health practices, regenerative practices, and expanding those onto a broad acre, broad acre application. So it's, this is not just something we're talking about doing on a small scale anymore. This is something that can really be scaled up um, and provide real economic value for not just the farmer, but the community that surrounds that farm, the consumer base that's buying from that farm. Uh, it's, it's really a, a sort of a snowball that we're just sort of waiting to, to unleash um, uh, on the farming and the general consuming public. So. Awesome, thank you. And then I wonder, Michael, are you there? If you might speak to um, black farmers and, and uh, Native American farmers, are you there, Michael? All right, still maybe having a little trouble. Okay, next, what's our next question, Chris? Well, we had a question that ha that was about s some of the problem areas in agriculture and um, someone was expressing their concerns specifically about cattle feedlots and that, that model of uh, livestock production. And what could we do about that? Can we give livestock operators access to more humane and less damaging models um, for the, the latter stages of, of what they're doing. Well, I think this might be a question back for you, Dr. Fike. Are you there? I'm here. All right. Yeah, so, I mean, that, that's a, so, so a lot of these things are bundled up, right? It's kind of a Gordian knot. How do you, how do you get out of them? Uh, we have uh, market our, marketed ourselves or been marketed to, you know, think that corn raised beef is the best. Uh, we have ag policies that support large scale production and that stuff needs to go somewhere. So it goes into biofuel facilities or it goes into feedlots, that sort of thing. And so, and then, you know, part of that has been our historic cheap food uh, and, and fuel policies. And so, you know, if you want something that's done cheaply, uh, we, we set up the system so that we can do it. And so feedlots have uh, met that burden, so to speak. But, you know, that has an awful lot of environmental costs, which is part of the reason we're having this conversation now. Um, so, I mean, I guess the question is, what can we do to get these farmers to change? I'm going to say change the market, change your purchasing habits, if that's what you want. I mean, if you want grass-finished beef uh, and you see it's a superior product, or you think it has benefits relative to the landscape, then vote with your pocketbook and you know, get in a policy. Awesome. I don't know, I have any better answers than that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, good, all right, Chris, other questions for us? Uh, well, we, we had a, a couple people asking about um, specific, very specific issue of dried human sewage as a, uh, farming or landscaping resource and you know the the question arose well is this is this good regenerative farming uh resource and can it be done safely or is it just dangerous Woo! all right so yeah so i'm 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 the person right. to address right. this unfortunately because this is one of the most emotional subjects that um, throughout my career and throughout uh, the last three or four decades that scientists have uh, been put on the spot about. You could look at scientists who will stand on either side of the issue of this uh, because of the, all the, the concerns of, of uh, pathogens, of uh, heavy metals, of, um, of uh, organic toxic micro constituents that we hear about uh, routinely in this material. So uh, it's my perspective having worked with um, what we call biosolids, human treated sewage sludge uh, for decades is that when the products are treated uh, correctly uh, when they are uh, properly stabilized using 
anaerobic digestion, composting, pasteurization techniques, that um, the uh, pathogens in these materials are essentially gone. And the, uh, th there are uh, systems uh, that have been put in to ensure that uh, the pollutants uh, in the, in the, uh, such as heavy metals are greatly reduced and not uh, anywhere near what would be needed to create any sort of a, a human health or environmental problem. So overall, I feel like they are very safe products when treated correctly. They're used in large scale agriculture. And when they're composted, uh, gardeners have access to these kind of materials and I've been using them in my own home gardens for decades also. The, one of the issues that makes them appear more dangerous than, um, than my personal feeling about this is that they have uh, not been able to be used for organic farming. So this was more of a um, political social issue that occurred 20, 30 years ago in which the uh, canned, the, the, the food production industry uh, uh, determined that they would not accept uh, products, fresh food products that were grown like this. And the organic um, regulations that came out uh, under lots of uh, duress from concerned citizens decided it would be easier not to permit uh, biosolids as, as an amendment in organic food production. Even though these products are treated to a greater extent than most manures are, for example, when they're used. Now I could go on for hours or you could all go to my biosolids website and, uh, and listen to hours of webinars or contact me directly, but I think I'll, for the sake of time and other speakers, I'll uh, stop right now. Thank you so much, Greg. All right, so I just learned that Michael is back on. We, we didn't have him as co-host. So I wonder, Michael, did you want to add anything to what we've been, any of the questions that have come up? You can unmute yourself, I believe. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can I add something? Yeah. Um, so about that question, of the, the question of livestock has come up, and so is the question of, of returning um, human sewage to the, to the land. And what I'd like to emphasize is that you know, the soil is designed to work a certain way. And, and a nice guy to quote is Sir Albert Howard. You know, I mentioned him in, when I was talking. He's regarded as the father of organic agriculture. And his law of return, actually, it's a law of nature that everything we can that we take from the land should go back. And so the, the way it should work is for the human waste to go back to the fields where the food we ate was, 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 um, was grown. And he also said we, sh we shouldn't farm without livestock because livestock allow us to have perennial forages in our, in our farming systems and um, manure going back to the soil as well. But we want to mimic nature. And, and so we have a lot of broken systems and they're big, humongous questions on how to fix those systems, just like, like John White just said. Um, and we have uh, livestock in feedlots instead of on, on grasslands where they might prefer to be. But ultimately, the soil wants that organic matter back. And it, it, it wants the opportunity to be rotated to sod so that, and, and have cows eating that forage. Um, that's how it's supposed to work. The hard part is how do we get back to that? Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Representative Willett, we have a question here for you. So apparently there is a bill in the Georgia, in Georgia, SB 1374, which is attempting to set up a task force in Georgia to study regenerative agriculture practices and make recommendations. We're wondering, do you think Virginia can exercise some leadership in this area, or is it more a national policy focus with regenerative agriculture? What can you say about that? Uh, excuse me, Ellie, let me break in. I, the GA stands for uh, oh, Gen General Assembly. General Assembly. Oh, yeah. God, okay. it is Virginia. I was like, what are we talking about, Georgia? All right. So 
That is, I, I, I'm, I will flag that measure. I'm not familiar with it because my comment was going to be we need to be hitting it at all levels. Certainly, what uh, Congressman Spanberger is doing nationally, as you mentioned there, that that that's significant, and obviously that has broad broader coverage. But uh, we certainly want to do things uh, here in Virginia as well and, and in parallel. So I I will check on that. I'll, I'll look it up right now. I didn't know if did you actually have, uh, tell me again? You said there was a yeah. G. There. Yeah, Chris, jump in for me there. Uh, I believe that it's been through the House and is doing the crossover to the Senate. Um, so I believe it did pass out of the, the Del House of Delegates. Um, but it, it's being considered in the Senate. I think the number is SB 1374. Right, to set up a study on carbon sequestration, Ann says. Okay, okay. Yeah, that, that, I have seen that, and that is definitely something we support. When you said it was coming from Georgia, I said, well, anything Georgia does, we're going to do 10 times better. So that's... <laughs> well, there you go. Now I know how to challenge you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, no, we absolutely will look at that. And, and uh, I know through, I mentioned earlier, I'm on the Ag Committee, and that will come back back through us. But uh, it's really important. And, and I'll tell you, this, this, the group tonight is, is extraordinary, and I really will be counting on you because, as I said, I... I, I may have a little more farming experience than Abigail, but that only makes me like this much more qualified. <laughs> you guys are the experts and, and we really do need the input. So let, we will follow up on that, but thanks, thanks for flagging that. Wonderful, thank you. All right, Chris, maybe, maybe one more question, maybe two, we'll see. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this one. We, we've had some, some people in the chat talk about carbon markets, but they're also talking about um, like cap and trade sort of systems. And there, you know, there, there, I guess there's some suspicion on like gaming the system in some ways. Um, so I, I guess that's a question for all the participants, but probably more for the, the, uh, the lawmakers. When you're crafting legislation, how do you make sure that it is something that will produce good results rather than being gamed by, um, you know, wealthy individuals, perhaps. Who would like to jump in on that one? I'll start. I'm sure uh, Abigail have, will have more to add on that. No, I think, just as I mentioned, you, you get input from multiple sources. You can't, it, it's very rare, I hope it's very rare, at least in my experience, it's been rare that we would, would do something enact legislation without input from multiple sources. And, and I think, um, yeah, you have folks you rely on for, for different things and you have your own experience to bring to the table, but you, you would want a broad range of interest. Because I, I will say, yeah, most of the bills that I put forward are brought to me, meaning that, that a group has, has come together, maybe an individual to suggest something. And that's wonderful. I certainly support that, but you have to understand where they're coming from. And I think what's, what's more impressive to me is when a, a broad coalition the folks come together and say, hey, this is something we think can make Virginia better. Um, that's only a better starting point, but you do, you, you do want a, a lot of people at the table for sure. Wonderful, thank you. Hey, Ellie, can I jump in? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, uh, uh, as, a, as a farm consultant, as a farmer, as someone who talks to a lot of farmers all across the state, the absolute best carbon market we have is the consumer market. And whether you're selling directly to your neighbors or your family or your community, or whether you're selling into a, a larger wholesale type account or to local retail accounts. In my 15 years of experience in doing this kind of work, the absolute best carbon market we have is for people to find farmers that are farming with regenerative practices and implementing soil health practices, whether they consider themselves to be conventional or biological or organic or some sort of mishmash in between, the best carbon market we have is absolutely the consumer market. That's what's driving the changes in agriculture. It's driving the innovation from the ground up. It's not coming from the top down, it's coming from the ground up and the consumer market is driving that. So when we talk about the carbon market or the markets that are driving these changes, it's the consumer market and educating folks and showing folks that these changes are making a real difference in their own communities and with their own personal health, that's where we need to target our efforts. So the folks that are here that have the ability to make the policy the, to make that happen, that's what we really need to focus on, in my opinion. Thank you. All right. Thanks. 
we've got five minutes left and uh, we did wanna first thank the panelists for spending this time with us and for preparing and for the work you do uh, day in and day out year round in regenerative agriculture, in growing the food for us, in making the policy to make our lives better. So thank you to the panelists. If anyone, you, this is what you do in Zoom when you're ex clapping your hands, you wave your hands. So wave your hands for the panelists. And we are very interested in continuing this kind of conversation between uh, policymakers and educators and farmers. And we would like to know what people are also interested in. So I invite you to go to the chat and to chat to the ask me questions and suggest any topics you're interested in having us cover. We ourselves are looking at uh, the topic of how to integrate agriculture and renewable energy production, so agrovoltaics and other things like that. So if you have a topic that is of interest to you, go ahead and put that in the chat and any uh, feedback you'd like to give us. We have a survey and do you have the link to the survey? Did we make a little survey that you want to send to people? Unmute yourself and... No, no, we'll do that uh, I'm gonna, after the event. We'll send out a link to the recording and a resource page from all the great resources that our panelists have mentioned. And we'll put a little survey in there and we can uh, ask for topics that people would like to explore also. Wonderful. All right, good. Well, thank you all so much. And um, there's... Someone just asked me to put something in the main chat. Let me see if I can do that. Okay, and I am going to run. Um, I'm gonna Anne. I'm gonna let you wrap it up. I'm here with my aunt. She's okay, with me right now. Uh, or Emily. All right. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs> um, also, uh, and all the numerous email uh, Eventbrite notices that I pushed out to all you guys. I have to apologize, but I didn't want anyone to forget this. There's the, the return email. Please feel free to use it and put questions in there, uh, other topics that you want to explore, any resources that you want to suggest that we put in the resource page, um, and we'll get those out to everybody. And Emily, are you here? Oh. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Did you have anything you wanted to say before we? Well, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming and it seems like it's been a wonderful event and uh, we've had a lot of enthusiasm. And yes, we're sorry if we didn't get to everyone's questions. So we we'll have to do it again. 448 people register for this. A lot of interest in this topic and it's a big, big topic. And I just so appreciate everyone's time. It, it was fabulous. Thank you. Bye. Our, <laughs> thank you all so much for coming tonight. Have a good night. Bye.